Welcome to American Players Theater Talk Backs to Go. I'm Buzz Kemper, and I invite you to take a walk up the hill with Orange Schroeder and me as Orange chats with director James Bonin and actor Jim DeVita about APT's 2016 production of Arcadia by Tom Stoppard. We're here to discuss Tom Stoppard's play Arcadia, and I'm fortunate to have director James Bonin with me and Jim DeVita, who is playing a character with the intriguing name of Bernard Nightingale. Uh, thank you both for being here today. Of course. Thank you. Uh, I know that we have a lot to say about Arcadia, and uh, just wanted to start out with a little bit of background for those that are not familiar with Tom Stoppard, although his name is uh, hard to avoid in the theater world. He was actually born uh, Thomas Straussler in 1937 in Czechoslovakia. Uh, he and his family left because of the uh, Nazi occupation, and uh, he arrived in England in 1948, having spent three years at a boarding school in Darjeeling in uh, the Indian Himalayas. Now, I give that as background because Stoppard is one of my favorite playwrights because of his love of the English language, and the fact that he came to it uh, as a second language, I think, is fascinating. But I'm not the only person who has Stoppard as their favorite playwright. Um, James shares with Stoppard the fact that they're both avid readers, and he feels, uh, from what I've heard, that Stoppard is one of the finest contemporary playwrights and has, in fact, named his bookstore in Spring Green, Arcadia, after this play. So we want to know, James, why. What what do you love about Stoppard and what do you love about this play in particular? Well, I love about Stoppard his uh, his rigor and his fascination with ideas, uh, the fact that he was uh, a, a person who chose not to go to university and he went out into the working world and became a reporter. Uh, but he, he he's educated himself over and over again about the ideas that he gets fascinated by. Uh, he's a he travels with these sort of portable bookshelves, these leather bookshelves uh, that sort of keep him connected to whatever he's, his brain is provoked by at the moment. But I think his writing is, and I, I think Jimmy can attest to this, it's, it's extremely careful writing so that uh, what seems very casual to the ear is, is really phenomenally carefully constructed. And, he, and like Shakespeare, he's a real man of the theater. Uh, you know, he sort of will pitch away anything that doesn't work. And he writes very reliably uh, in a humorous way too so that his plays, especially his mature plays, have a, a, a deep sense of feeling and a deep sense of play but they're always about something that, that is rigorous for you to kind of take in into your brain and, and tussle with. And I think all of those things make me love him from the very first time I heard when I was a young audience member uh, performance of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in 1969. Um, so that's a very long time to be attracted to somebody's writing. <laughs> uh, well, and you mentioned about the earlier and later plays. Um, APT, of course, has done Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, which was written not that long before you saw it. It was written right. in 1968. And then uh, the phenomenal Travesties, which was done recently, which was written in 74. But this play is from 1993. And it's quite different than those two plays, don't you think? Oh, it's profoundly different. Uh, it's much less uh, overtly show-offy, uh, which I think he would attest to. Uh, you know, he's all, he really wasn't much interested in character in the early years. Uh, you know, the jokes he always made was that anybody in his plays could say any of the lines. He was just interested in the lines being heard. Uh, but I think actors taught him to to care about character and to see how characters really mattered in storytelling. But I think he, what he really found in this play was a phenomenal way to tell a complicated story, to, to hold the audience uh, in, a, in a, this kind of tension between these two periods of time, 180 years apart in the same room of a house. Uh, but Jimmy can probably talk more about what it's like to to act those words. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little yeah. bit about your character, um, Bernard Nightingale? Oh, Bernard? Uh, Bernard? Oh, Bernard. I'm still learning who Bernard is, to Bernard. be honest with you. But, um, well, I th I'm, I'm kind of on the opposite spectrum of having uh, never had the opportunity to be in a stop art uh, play. I've seen them and admired them. So this is my first foray into 
his work, and I kind of agree with you, James. It reminds me a little bit like working on Shakespeare because his ideas are so large sometimes, so big, they can be really intimidating to an actor, uh, at least for me. It can be really intimidating at first, like Shakespeare can. But until you get your mind and your body and your soul wrapped around these ideas and then they become part of you, then you can make them accessible. Um, so it's a real learning curve for me of... Because you can, you can generally understand what we call the gloss of an idea. We talk about that in Shakespeare, too. Okay, okay, I kind of know what you're saying, but no. Until it gets in your cells, the detail of it. And then it's not enough for you as an actor just to know it in your cells. How do you communicate that to an audience? And how do you communicate that to a 1,200-seat house? You know, all, so those are all challenges of this kind of work. Yeah, I think that's a particular challenge to do it both outside where there's a lot of distraction and the size mm -hmm. of the, the house because it really is – his plays are, are written for your ear you know, in a way that Shakespeare's are too. I mean the, mm -hmm. you know, the ideas need to sort of dance in there <laughs> and collide and uh, so to try to make them big enough to, to be conveyed to 1,100 people but also specific enough and, and connected enough so that the audience doesn't get lost – and the actor doesn't get lost uh, is you know it's a it's a huge complicated challenge just yeah. even just the plots are complicated right, right. was there you a know. consideration of doing it in the touchstone instead of up the hill that was not that i know of i don't think so no yeah. it's too too large a cast to yeah. i believe for inside there there's right. lo lots of vagaries that go into what gets chosen for what but it's like you know when we first worked on um, Ernest together you know, the show's very hard to do outside to keep the kind of, that. this is not like that, but the same kind of thing. How do we do that show outdoors in a 1,200-seat house? Yeah, that was 1998. Yeah, yeah that was a Dating ourselves. Whew, boy. Uh, On the other hand, I think because of the uh, theme of landscape architecture, doing it outdoors, it, it's probably one of the first times it's ever been performed outdoors. Yeah, you know, I don't have it any It might very well, yeah, it might yeah. be. Yeah, I, I have know. no idea about that, but... Possibly. You know, and, and that doesn't mean just being, uh, obviously this makes it sound pedestrian, it doesn't mean being loud. It means you need to find characters, create characters that are, are uh, I don't know what the word is, of, of a larger being than you would do in a 200-seat indoor space. Right. Yeah. yeah, and I don't think he really writes absolutely realistic characters. I mean, I don't think most good writers don't for the stage because you you know, they, they need to be 15% yeah, yeah. larger but, than... You're not going to see Bernard in your, <laughs> your local diner, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah, I just... Or they may be, he may be arrested if you saw him there. Right. No, uh, I mean the passion, you know, Jim, you know, Bernard, just the passion that he has. He's a, a walking, you know, time bomb of that, this thing that he has, that he thinks he has, that he wants. And, yeah, because it's, I mean, it's a detective story, really. I mean, it's a bunch of people. Thomasine is trying to solve a problem that she doesn't even have any language for yet because it's 1809 when she first starts to think about it, about a math issue which turns out to be the second law of thermodynamics. Don't be frightened, folks. Don't worry. There's, not, it, that's, there's no quiz at the end of the show. But, but Bernard is there at this house because he firmly believes that he's uncovered one of the mysteries about Lord Byron's life, which is where he – why he left – England at the height of his early success and it's one of those like Fermat's last theorem which is also mentioned in the play and oddly three months after the play opened in 1993 Fermat's last theorem was solved after almost 300 years uh, so that's why you really can't move this play very far from its from its moorings in time uh, but it but the play is obsessed with time anyway and I think Bernard you know, the way that Bernard journeys through the play, we slowly, the audience slowly is let in on the fact that everything that Bernard assumes by what he's found, everything he, he's assuming is wrong. But that doesn't mean, that has nothing to do with Bernard's passion for finding it. And so the play is, is that hunger for learning things, that hunger for knowledge and putting things together. Yeah, I think for Bernard it would be like, like a Shakespeare scholar discovering a new play by Shakespeare or discovering that some amazing fact that nobody in the world knew about Shakespeare. I mean, the kind of fame and notoriety that I, would, that I will acquire right. once I prove this true with, and I'm certain that it's true. Yeah, and you get the feeling from him in the early scenes that he feels a little overlooked. 
you know, he's living in Brighton, teaching at Sussex. And he just feels like he's better than that. Publishing mediocre papers yeah. for 20 yeah. years, and now he yeah. has this right. thing. He's got this thing. Which is yeah. <clears throat> perfect for a Madison audience. I mean, think how many of us have some ties to the university community and, uh, you know, either the scientific community or the uh, literature um, studies where the discovery of a, mm -hmm. something new about Byron would really mean something to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it's paired with with another scholar in the play, in the contemporary story named Hannah Jarvis, who's there uh, with a, a sort of an idea about a hermit. But Byron <laughs> Bernard actually provides her with information that causes her to change her whole focus of her story. And she doesn't get the answer to her story until the second to the last line of the play. So that's how long the, the mystery, you know, gets pushed in the play. And you said that you said uh, that you thought that the last scene of the play is some of the finest writing in American theater. I think that it's because of the way that he combines the two time frames. And he, you know, the, because it moves back and forth between one time period and the other until the seventh scene, until, frankly, even in the seventh scene, we're already involved with the scene and we kind of have our assumption of what's happening. And then all of a sudden we realize, oh, my gosh, those are people from the other world. And so he kind of, uh, well, he calls it in the play doubled by time. And so there are people, you know, on stage, they don't see each other, obviously, but we see them all together and we see them um, kind of struggling with this, with one of these last big ideas. And then uh, magically, both worlds talk about the same idea simultaneously. So it becomes four voices instead of the usual two voices. And it really is quite astonishing in its effortlessness, let's put it that way. It almost has a musical sense of, you know, the voices coming together. The play is very musical, I think. It's very symphonic. And there's a lot of fun and sex in it too, so we don't want to <laughs> discount that. Oh God! Which is well, actually, I, I'm not being a little facetious, but but it balances that with all these huge, grand ideas with the normal, everyday things we live with and never go away. Absolutely. Uh, which is uh, he's, he's a sex in literature, right? Know, which is <laughs> what, what else do you need? I mean, yeah, exactly. Uh, no, but I think but sex, the foibles sex of drives human being, much yeah. of the play. I mean, you know. And passion can be sexy. Yeah, and exactly. intellect can be sexy. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I think that's what Starbird's really showing is, is how sexy intellect is. You know, and I think that's, I just think it's, in that way, the fact that he's put all that together and added that the extra disruptive nature of sex yeah, well, I mean, in fact, the very first play that Jimmy and I worked on was the misanthrope, as David Frank would call it, uh, mm -hmm. uh, by Moliere. And there's a line that, that Jimmy had in that play, which is, reason doesn't work in love, you know, or something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that reason doesn't when – you, when, once love is in the picture, we all behave uh, – well or badly, depending on one's point of view, <laughs> but it change, you know it just changes everything, and that so that becomes for Stoppard part of deterministic chaos is the, is sex is part of the mix of deterministic chaos, and it, and the play is very very funny because he's he he loves jokes you know I mean he called himself based on your introduction he called himself a bounced check. Oh, yeah. <laughs> great pun. <laughs> well, I'm sure this will be a, a wonderful um, round of sex, literature, and humor mm -hmm. with intellectualism thrown in up on the hill. That's a great grab bag. Yeah, we can't right. wait. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Talk Backs to Go is a production of Orange Tree Imports and Audio for the Arts. Your host is Oren Schroeder. I'm Buzz Kemper. Our music is used by permission of the artist. Please find us on iTunes and YouTube under APT Talk Backs to Go. Thank you for listening.